age-related changes in the immune system could be affecting oral health yes, and almost absolutely. certainly are. There's a decline that happens with tissue, taste changes that happen with age. And what is interesting to me is as dentists, we actually see some of those age-related changes in your own dental x-rays. My name is Matt Cabral, and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. So, hey, everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Jonathan on today. So John is a professor of oral health sciences at the University of Washington. Um, John received his Doctor of Dental Surgery in 2015, so he is a practicing dentist, and he also completed his PhD thesis with yours truly in 2019, and the title of his thesis was Targeting mTOR to Reverse Age-Associated Periodontal Disease. Um, John is sort of interesting in the sense that not only is a DDS PhD, but he skipped his postdoctoral training and uh, went right to being a faculty member at the University of Washington, where he has continued to do research on oral health and the relationship to aging. And so um, today we're just going to have a conversation. I think we'll probably end up uh, having actually two parts to this episode. I think in the first part, we'll talk a little bit about your trajectory, John, how you sort of got interested in oral health and its intersection with aging um, and some of the things people can maybe do to give themselves the best opportunity at, at um, having good oral health throughout their lives. And then in the second part, we'll get into a deeper dive on your research, what you've learned, uh, particularly rapamycin, which I know, you know, as an interest of mine and a lot of people who listen to this channel are interested in. Um, and then talk a little bit about what you're doing now uh, and in the realm of uh, rapamycin and oral health in humans. So um, let's, uh, let's jump right in. So I think the first thing that I think is pretty interesting is you have taken what is a relatively uncommon path, right? In the sense that you are a, a DDS PhD. Um, and so for people who may not know what that is, that's uh, kind of like the dental version of an MD PhD, meaning you have a degree in dentistry. You can practice dentistry as long as you maintain your license. And then you've also done research sufficient to be granted a doctoral degree, a, a, a PhD in research. Um, and I, you know, there aren't, as far as I know, that many practicing dentists that actually do scientific research. Uh, and there aren't that many researchers who do dentistry. So it's sort of an interesting path. And I think, you know, it be, might be interesting to our listeners to understand, like, what sort of led you down this path? How did you decide that you wanted to do both research and uh, and be a dentist? Yeah. Um, well, well th yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation, Matt. I mean, I think the last time we chatted, it was, you know, I was at probably like my last thesis, just the us two. And so I think it's great to just kind of come back and kind of see where I'm still at and kind of where you're going. So thanks again for the invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's pretty much a long story, but I I um, always wanted to do a PhD. That was my, that was always the goal. And I was always interested in science and discovery. Um, and actually in high school, I did a lot of research um, up at the University of Washington, hmm. uh, just because at the time my high school was brand new. I, I grew up in a, uh, a town called Puyallup, Washington. And, now is it um, Puyallup or Puyallup? <laughs> it's Puyallup. I, I don't know how, how else to pronounce it, but um, yeah, it's a uh, it, it's a small area like right down south of Tacoma. But um, so uh, yeah, so I grew up in Puyallup, and there was really nothing else at the time around Puyallup, and so I always wanted to science. So I started commuting up with my parents to UW, uh, doing research, and that was kind of what I always wanted to do. I didn't know what area, but I just love being in the lab. I love learning new things. Um, I even like at some points failing at certain things because I always knew I was always going to learn. So I always, you know, I was, I always wanted to be in the lab. That's a long commute up from Puyallup to do yeah. research. Wow. Yeah. And, and the reason I did that, I think it was partly uh, because I wanted to do it. And also, you know, uh, you know, I had parents who really supported yeah, that. That's um, important for sure. And so uh, they drove me every weekend up and, you know, labs, they're pretty much open 24 seven. So I kind of started off there. And um, so where, where this dentistry fits in was I always was doing undergraduate research all through undergrad um, at the University of Washington. And the lab kind of where I settled upon was actually a dental lab. And what was your major as an undergrad? Uh, molecular and cell biology. Okay. Yeah. So um, so I, I came across that lab and 
I was there uh, understanding innate immunity on the gingival tissues, you know, growing. So this was a dentistry lab. Dentistry was it in oral health sciences? It was oral biology at the time. Okay. Yeah, so they uh, were specifically interested in innate immunity and looking at oral bacteria. So I was growing oral bacteria, culturing cells, culturing gingival tissues from, you know, patients getting third molar extractions. And, um, and then I eventually got a job there because uh, they were looking for a research scientist. And I didn't know what I wanted to do after school. I was, you know, thinking of a graduate school, but <laughs> I wasn't really, and I had to, you know, ha get a job right after. And so uh, that lab offered me a position as a research scientist. So I ended up, you know, staying there, kind of trying to figure out what I want to do next. And a lot of dentists came through the lab trying to get projects done. And, um, you know, I felt like, I felt like a lot of the clinicians knew what they wanted to do, but they didn't understand the science. Right. And then the scientists- Which, by the way, is typical, right? Right, right exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and to me, like, as a, as a scientist, and I'm still learning as a scientist, I was thinking this, like, simple, simple questions, simple assays, like, they were asking all these really simplified questions. And I was like, what? We could do way more than just clinical. And so um, and then I kind of, kind of did, okay, what if I become a dentist, right? Is there a path hmm. for me to do- dentistry with research. Um, Which is sort of interesting. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it's always been my impression, you know, because as you know, I've had, had lots of undergraduates yeah. come through my lab when I was at the University of Washington, that it seems like most people align on dentistry relatively early right. who end up going to be a, go, <laughs> yeah. going to be a, a dentist. And, right. But for right. you, it sounds like it's pretty late. Like you graduated already, yeah. you were doing research, and right. it just happened to be in a dentistry lab. Right. Yeah. And that's what kind of spurred your interest in becoming a practicing dentist. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and, and I mirror that because even now I have pre-dental students early on in their undergrad, they know exactly what they want to do is become a dentist. And yeah. so I try to support everything they can because you're right, I did start late. I mean, I had like part-time jobs, Starbucks and here and there, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, it did come later, but it came in the lab, right? It came in that lab. And um, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to combine the two. And I heard about the dual degree programs. And there's not that many, at, and even now there's not that many around the country. And um, so what I had to do was apply to dental school first, because I knew I could do the PhD part. I mean, just had to take juries and that's not an issue. But for the dental part, I had to go back, take some extra classes, study for my dental exam, like dental, um, uh, called the DATs. And so um, went that route and uh, applied to different universities. And um, the UW Dental School was the first one to contact me. And so um, so that's how I got into the program. So I did the dental school separately, got into dental school. I see. So, so it's sort of different from most MD PhDs mm -hmm. then in the sense that for an MD PhD, typically you would apply to a dedicated... Right. MD, PhD program, right, physician right. scientist program. Whereas, is, is this true in general for DDS, PhDs? You apply to the DDS part first, right. get accepted into the dental school, and right. then later apply to the PhD? Yeah, you piece? kind of apply together at the same time. You apply to the dental program and you apply to the PhD program. And then they have, they just say, oh yeah, we have this application from John. Oh yes, we have the same application. Got it. He wants to do, do a degree. So you could actually not get into the PhD and just get into dentistry. I see. You can huh. just get into dental school and not get into PhD. Yeah. And then if you get into both at that time, when I was going, we had a final kind of interview with the dean and everybody else. And so, um, so once I got into both, that's kind of how I started the program. Um, and, and one thing about unique about the dual degree, especially at the University of Washington was, and like you said, I had the option of finishing dental school first. A lot of schools, just like MD, PhD, you don't, you have to actually finish your PhD before you go back to clinic and get your degree. And a lot of dental schools are like that. Um, but UW allowed me to enter with the same class, the same dental um, class, and then graduate all four years. So even now, by graduating with the same class, I have a lot of colleagues now in the dental field, clinicians, right. specialists that I refer to or, um, um, you know, send patients uh, to, and then and then I once the dental program was done, I did my PhD coursework in between, trying to fit them in, um, and then once I got my dental license, then I ended up just kind of finishing my PhD after that. So yeah, so help me get the timeline right because mm -hmm. I knew so when we first met, I think yeah. it was 2015. You'd yeah. gotten your yeah. dental degree already, yeah, right, and you had started your PhD right. by then, right? Yeah. So how I fell in to your lab was also kind of... Yeah, I like how you, you know, say that, how yeah, I fell into yeah, your lab. Yeah, well, okay. well so, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> now so, I get it. <laughs> well, what happened was, well, I, I didn't even think going into aging in the period. Like, okay, so period, I was going right? to ask you that. Yeah, yeah so yeah. let's go through the, that sort of process, so, right? So I already I already did my rotations, which is part of all kind of PhD programs. You do a rotation, try to figure out mentors. So Yeah, I already, and just for the, the, the audience listening who may not know sort of how 
graduate school, PhD school works. Rotations are kind of like a try before you buy option. Almost all <laughs> graduate programs have this where right. usually, it, like if it's a straight PhD program, it's in the first year of the program, mm -hmm. a PhD student will be taking their coursework and then they'll try out usually three different labs, 10 to 12 week, what they call rotations, right. just to see if it's a good fit, right? And yeah. so this is kind of the same idea, except your rotations were sort of spread out while mm -hmm. you were doing the the dental school yep. part of your training. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I already had a lab already set up and um, it was a cranial fa facial genetics lab. So I was actually going to, um, so I did my rotation there. I really enjoyed it. Really good mentors. Uh, I knew as a scientist, I was going to do really well in there in terms of getting the strong science that I always wanted. Um, and so I actually started in that lab right after, right after I graduated uh, for a few months. And the PI, so the main, um, I guess, director of the lab, um, got a really good offer at another university. And so, mm. uh, as happens a lot, right, it does, <laughs> yeah. And and it was it was, and I really still to this day, I you know I keep close contact with them. And and he told me way early on that this was going to happen. You have some options: either follow me and I'll go and support you, or you know you're going to have to stay here and try to figure out something else, right? And so I, you know, just had my dental degree and. You know, I, I couldn't leave Seattle, and so I ended up just staying. And but I still had to finish a PhD. Now, now I could say this, but I technically didn't have to finish a PhD because there was no written contract or anything. So I could have just said, "I got my dental license." Sure, I'm gonna bounce, right. right? But my whole goal for why I went through this was to do research, right? So, right. Um, so I got to spend a little more time in the clinic, seeing patients more than I would normally would do, and. One thing that kept coming up every time, and a lot of the patients I was seeing were kind of middle-aged to older, was uh, things were like breaking down or uh, patients would come in and they'll say like, it's the same repertoire. Everything was fine. I do everything you tell me to do or the other dentist tell me to do, but like things are not working or things are breaking or I, I suddenly have gum disease. Yeah. And as dentists, you know, we, well, we only say one or two things. It's like, well, it's just we're getting older. Right. Uh, there's really nothing much. It was just getting older. But then a, a scientist part of me, I kind of was thinking, I was like, well, dentists probably follow their patients more than like 10 years, 15 years. Right. So it's like we know this is coming. Yeah. But we're not doing anything regarding that. So then I kind of was like, OK, well, if everybody's aging and we're seeing these patients all the time throughout their life. You know, why isn't anybody actually looking at aging? Right. So right. you just kind of picked up on from your experience. Right. That that many of the problems that people have right. with their oral health have the strong age associated component exactly. right. and that the reaction of the dental community in general is well that's just part of getting older right? exactly right right yeah. and um and even now like you know we'll see like crowns kind of breaking down maybe yeah. here and there and then we'll say well you know you are getting older so we'll wait a little bit but we're not really yeah. proactive on things and so really got me thought about think about aging and you know what is actually like what is actually aging okay itself. so this is pretty neat so you got your dental degree you were sort of you know trying to find the lab that you were going to do your phd thesis work in and because of your clinical experience you yeah. kind of made this connection yeah, right? right right and so then that is how you ended up eventually in my office in right, 2015. Yeah. So what yeah. happened between making this connection yeah. and actually coming to talk yeah. to me? So I, and I just started doing my own research, right? I, I had no, I had no idea that this whole field existed, right? It's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, all this, by really, this field, you mean the aging, sorry, aging biology, field, aging. geroscience, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And just the understanding that, that aging is just biology. Like that, right. that whole concept I had no idea about. And at the time I, you know, called my uh, uh, program director and I was like, you know, I'm interested in aging. You know, I, I didn't know how to describe it, right? Like, I, I don't know if there's like something related to it. I don't want to do anything in terms of statistical part of like, um, you know, looking at data. I want to do like molecular science. And uh, he was like, well, there's, you know, the Nathan Shock Center. And uh, I don't know if you want to describe what the Nathan Shock Center Yeah, is, I mean, but. so the Nathan Shock Center is one of, uh, at that time, there were five. I think now there are seven NIH-funded centers of excellence around the basic biology of aging. And so what these centers do, they're not very much money, unfortunately. But, I mean, what these centers really do is they create sort of a community of researchers within an institution who all have a shared interest in the biology of aging, support some core resources, and also give out pilot projects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like we have the Nathan Shock Center, so maybe you could find 
you know, um, an investigator in there. So I started looking and there was one guy who was like director of this, co-director of this, right? Leader of this. And I was like, if, if, if I go to this lab, I would definitely understand aging. And so that's why I fell into That's not how I remember the story. <laughs> I remember the story as you had gone to talk to Peter Rabinovich, who was the director at that time, and he said, right. "I don't know what he said." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it you was an email, and right? then you it emailed email, me, or you right. emailed him. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, said, "Well, Peter, email. Peter didn't want to have anything to do with me, so you're like my second <laughs> choice." That's how I, I remember you, yeah. the story. <laughs> well, I think I emailed Peter because he was the prime director. Yeah, he there. was the director yeah. of the Shock Center so, at that time. Um, yeah. And then after that, it was the co-director. But yeah, yeah. fell into your lab. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I still don't know what I, I... I remember vaguely what I said in the meeting, but I remember I was... Yeah. I, I was like, oh gosh, I hope he understands where I'm coming from. Yeah. Because... And I did, clearly. Right, I mean, yeah. I, so I'll tell you how I, re I remember it. The first... Th the funny thing is, I may have told you this, but I remember the first line of your email, and it was like, <laughs> Dear Dr. Caberline... I am Jonathan on a DDS PhD student. And I vividly remember being like, what is a DDS PhD? Because <laughs> I had never heard of that dual degree program yeah. at that time. So this just goes to show like how right. like small these programs are in yeah. the whole grand scheme of things. Right. Um, and so I, I Googled it and I was like, oh, yeah, OK, dentist PhD. That's interesting. <laughs> and and then I was like, you know, and I'm kind of like the kind of guy where if something piques my interest. I'll be like, okay, yeah, yeah let's get yeah, together yeah. and talk about it. And I remember you came to the office and you basically just laid out, I think more or less what, what you, what you said, along with a couple of data points, one of which was that, you know, some oral, some diseases of the oral cavity, in particular periodontal disease, have this very strong age-related component. So I think you, in your research, you had kind of dug up some of the numbers to, to support the idea of what you'd seen in the clinic. And I mean, I just, it was like a light bulb went off in my head that I realized what I think you had picked up on, which is that, you know, there must be some connection between the biology of aging and aging of the oral cavity. And I immediately realized, like, it is so dumb that we treat the mouth different than the rest of the body when it comes to health. Obviously, these things are connected, but for sort of cultural reasons, they are treated completely separately. Separated, yeah, yeah. And so I think when I realized that, I was like, oh, there's something interesting here that I have never thought of before that seems really important. And so then it was like a no brainer. Well, I got right. this guy who really wants to do this, <laughs> yeah. who's got the chops to do it. Right. So right. let's go do it. Yeah. And, and I think I knew right away because, you know, uh, you know, I've been a science, I've been a research scientist and whatnot, but um, I think the other key thing why, uh, you know, I was excited to start because I knew from their first meeting is this guy is just going to let me do whatever I want to do. Oh, wait <laughs> like, a minute. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Within reason, <laughs> right? Within science, right? Yeah. Like, He's yeah. not going to hover over me, right. right? Which I understand for some students, and now because I'm my own PI, like I know some students require that, yeah. right? But I knew all right away that okay, this is a guy where if I bring a really stupid project, he's going to tell me that it's going to stupid project, not to hurt <laughs> me, but to make me a better scientist, right? Yeah. And I'm only saying that because I wanted to be a better scientist, yeah. right? Like yeah. I don't need a feel good PhD. I right. wanted to make sure I do the science correctly. I want to make sure I want to have a, a a mentor who really calls out that no, this is not good science. This is really good science that really trained me to become a scientist, right? And so that would allow me to figure out my own mistakes, right? right. And so I think after that first meeting, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm just gonna I'm gonna figure out what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna, you know, and I and I, you know, now thinking about it, I don't think there was. I mean, we met multiple times, but. Most of the time, it was more of me telling you, okay, this is what I found, this is what I found. Eh, okay, okay, let's try it this way. And Because it was never like long meetings. It was very short, short, all throughout the three or four years, yeah. I think I was in your Yeah, lab, well, so. and I mean, obviously, you know, we also had the group meetings where right. we would oh, go sure. through the data right. and talk about the data. Right. But yeah, right. I mean, I think you're right. And I mean, you know this, that my style when I was running a lab was was very much the way you described it, which is that, you know, a strong focus on doing high quality, rigorous science, really being skeptical of your own work more than other people's work even. Um, and, you know, giving a lot of freedom to the people in the lab to be able to learn from their mistakes, do experiments, right. follow crazy ideas a little bit, right? Yeah. Not too far, <laughs> but sometimes those crazy ideas really turn out to be important. So we'll talk more about sure. the science yeah. in a bit. But um, so so we had this, you know, this meeting, it, it seemed like an important problem. Mm -hmm. So let's go see what sort of damage we can do. Yeah. And, 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 and we'll get into that because I think, I mean, I, I, I you know, I am very 
pleased with the body of work that you did as your PhD. I think it is immensely important and, and will be important going forward. Um, but let's take a step back and talk for a minute about, you know, what do we know about aging and oral health, just from sort of a epidemiological perspective? Because again, right. this is part of what you communicated to me in that first meeting. I don't think most people, like I didn't know that, and I was in the aging field. I don't think most people know these relationships. So, yeah. so what do we know, just yeah. sort of at a high level? Um, so, I mean, I mean, we could put the report out there, but um, most recently, uh, the NIH, so uh, a branch within the NIH, and I don't want to go more details, but they released a publication based on ages. But basically, as the older you get, you not only have higher risk of getting oral disease like periodontal disease or even, um, you know, some some certain autoimmune diseases that show up in the mouth. Oh, interesting. Huh. But um, so uh, something like um, what does that look like? So usually it has to do with like some um, uh, inflammation related uh, or like gingivitis, right? Inflammation or even periodontal disease. So, so gingivitis, gum disease can be caused by autoimmune exactly, reactions? Exactly, right. Oh, interesting. Show up. So huh. for example, there's like, um, or it doesn't have to be autoimmune. Like for example, there's a, a rare, um, uh, a rare, let's see. I think it's a syndrome or a disease called Ehlers-Danlos where it's like a connective tissue. Right. Um, connective tissue style kind of disease that uh, periodontal disease is very different in those kind of patients that have ehlers downloads versus other periodontal disease. So, so again, the, there's a decline that happens with tissue, um, uh, taste changes that happen with age. Um, and what is interesting to me is as dentists, we actually see some of those age-related changes in your own dental x-rays. So if you look at a tooth, for example, the pulp chamber, so where all the nerves and vessels go through, as you age, that condenses over time. Hmm. And so a lot of older patients will come in and they'll have an infection, but they don't know because all those are condensed, right? And, and, and they don't know because the nerves are not yeah, exactly. registering right, the, the right. pain from the infection. Exactly, Got yeah. It. So they'll come with infection. I was like, oh, I didn't know, right? Wow. Um, and, and the nice thing about the biology of aging is this happens in mice. Just the condens just the tooth biology yeah. happens in mice, happens in non-human primates, right. happens with you know most dentate animals yeah. will follow the same line of thing, right? Um, so, so changes just with tooth itself uh, happens with um, age. Increased risk for oral pharyngeal cancer happens with age. Um, increased with fungal disease like candida happens just because of the immune. Right, so uh, dysregulation of the oral microbiome. Exactly, Yeah, right. which we'll talk more right. about the oral right, 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 microbiome, right. but maybe it's useful just to set the stage and, right. and say explicitly that, you know, most people, when we talk about the microbiome, they think of the gut microbiome. Right. Exactly. There's other yeah. microbial communities yeah, in our yeah. body, on yeah. our skin, and in our mouth and in other places. Right. And the oral microbiome plays a very important role in Absolutely. oral health, right? Yeah, yeah. And the microbiome, like we think of like the mouth as the whole microbiome, but each component within your mouth, so your tongue, your palate, your cheek, your gum tissue on the outside, yeah. inside the tooth, all have different Just microbiomes. because of like different pH or exactly. different oxygen exposure exactly. different or things tissues, like that. Right. Yeah. So um, because the mouth is really the one area where soft and hard tissue are together and you actually see it. Yeah. Right. And so, um, and so, yeah. So with age, a lot of things happen, just everything just declines or everything gets increased. Um, and we know that happens. Right? We know that that happens. And, um, and we see that as, oh, a salivary gland too. That's another yeah, thing too, right. right? So salivary flow, obviously, you know, it could be secondary to medications, which a lot of medications we take because <laughs> of age. Right. You know, so um, those can cause like low saliva, um, dry zero, mouth, dry right? mouth, right? right? So xerostomia um, or Sjogren's syndrome is another type of kind of autoimmune related that yeah. causes, you know, uh, dry lacrimal glands or even salivary glands. Right. So there's a lot of things that change that declines with age that yeah. uh, we see. So, so and, and I mean, I think that one of this, the interesting questions is, you know, how much of the changes in the mouth are due to age-related changes in the rest of the body and vice versa, right? Right, right, yeah. And I think um, it, it makes sense how if the whole system is aging, why the mouth wouldn't follow along yeah. with that. Um, and, yeah. and so I think that the, the kind of the dichotomy or the separation really is, as Dennis, we always say the mouth is a gateway to the whole body. But like we just say it for the sake of, in my opinion, we just say it for the sake of saying we actually yeah. haven't, there's evidence to show that, but we haven't really, um, really delved into that even more than yeah. we could have. Yeah. Yeah. So this graphic here is one that yeah. I think um, it's from a paper that we published uh, back in 2018. Mm -hmm. But I really like this graphic because I think it 
makes the point of how prevalent mm -hmm. oral age-related diseases are. I mean, this is showing that as you go from 30 years old to 65 years old, and this is in the United States, right? Yep. The prevalence of periodontal disease increases to the point where two-thirds of the people have it, right? Right. I mean, that's 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 more than almost any other age-related disease you can think of, right, in terms yeah. of, you know, how common it is. Right, right. And so this is really important to the health of a lot of people. And then maybe you can just take a minute to talk about what we know about people who have periodontal disease and their risk for other age-related right, right. diseases. Yeah. Um, obviously, the the relationship, I mean, you'll hear that, you know, having periodontal disease will put you at high risk for Alzheimer's disease, right? Um, there are some studies that show that the bacteria related to periodontal disease, so porphyrin gibbalis, some of the, um, I guess, the byproducts of that gets transferred, and that's one of the hypotheses, and that causes the inflammation and, and right. Talent. But let's yeah. just be clear. So that yeah. is a hypothesis right, right. now. Right, that's it's a hypothesis. Not, not right. completely clear, right. Right. you right. know, correlation versus causation. Right, 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 right. Yeah. right. So the correlate, and frankly, all of them are correlation. Yeah. Right. So periodontal disease with Alzheimer's, periodontal disease with heart disease, right, right. cardiovascular. Right. Periodontal with diabetes. Right. right? Do you um, do you remember off the top of your head kind of what those risk factors are? Like how much higher risk is it? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, okay. I'm we'll we'll, yeah, we'll we'll do that research out. and put it in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, we'll put it in there. Um, yeah. I, my, my recollection is it's like two or three. So it's I mean it's you know it's yeah. pretty they're pretty big, right? right. There's yeah. significant yeah. increases in risk for dementia. Is it only Alzheimer's disease or is it other dementias I think it's just as dementia. well? Yeah, just okay. dementia in general. Yeah. yeah, and cardiovascular disease and diabetes. diabetes. Yep. Um, and I just don't know how much has been looked at with other diseases, but it seems likely that there's going to be connections at least Absolutely. with other inflammatory driven diseases, yes, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so then I think this raises the question, which we were just sort of alluding to in passing, which is, you know, is this a causative relationship? Meaning, mm -hmm. is it that pathology in the mouth is driving pathology in the rest of the body? Or is it that the mouth is sort of like the canary in the coal mine, right? Yeah, Where yeah. it is an early sensor of things going wrong, maybe right. systemically. And yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we know the answer yet, no, but no, it's an important question. Yeah. I mean, th that, that is a question that we are actually looking in the lab right now and there's okay, ways cool. that we could do that. Um, but um, so the mouth is really easy to look at or evaluate. Right. And by easy, you mean non-invasive, right? Yeah, Whereas, right. you know, if you want to look at the kidney, you either, you can use blood markers sometimes, or you do a biopsy. Right. 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 But blood too, you got to like take the blood out, which you got to right. you know, put a needle in, you got to right. take things out. Right. Um, and so, uh, and because of that, um, you know, it, it is really, you know, the area in the coal mine where maybe that is the first place that some of these symptoms do show up. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned just in passing that you have some ways you're thinking about looking at this. Are you able yeah. to just like tell, give an example of yeah, yeah. how you might do for, that? For example, um, you know, you take uh, in mice, there are a variety of ways that you could induce periodontal disease, uh, just, just gum inflammation. So if, if you're going to utilize mice models, you could just, you know, mimic periodontal disease in a middle age to a slightly older age mice who don't have periodontal disease, induce that and take that out. And, and, and how would you, how do you induce periodontal disease? So there's a couple of ways you could tie, you know, a little suture around the teeth to cause localized inflammation. Got it. Because it's not present at the time. And that causes the clinical symptoms of periodontal disease, which is microbiome changes, bone loss, as well as inflammation. And so you trigger that or like middle age early on where potentially systemically there are changes that are already happening that hasn't shown up yet. So right. you aggravate that whole right. response. And then you remove that response. So the, the periodontal disease is there now, and then you follow the animal. Got it. Right. So the idea here is you take an animal that doesn't have periodontal disease or maybe doesn't have that level of severity, you induce periodontal disease sort of artificially, right. and then you look to see whether or not you see signs of sickness in the right. rest of the animal. Right, right. Um, and or even cardiac function, right? Yeah. So, so that's another thing you could look or at. Or metabolic response exactly, or right. things like that. Right, yeah. right. And then... And then I think, you know, the, the key thing here would be, or the key question would be, if you do that in a young animal, because we see this all the time in other right. fields, right, right where right, right. people will cause young animals to get cancer yep. or, sure. or dementia or whatever, um, you lose the aging biology yeah, component. Right. So it might be the case that periodontal disease, you know, has a different effect on the rest of the body and almost certainly it would be in a young organism mm -hmm. versus an old organism. Right. But if you start in middle age or later, then I think you can you can kind right. of guard yeah. against that. It, Interesting. Yeah. And, and even like if you just think simple like like immunosenescence, right? Like a young animal, yeah. you know, 
you know, you develop any like artificial inflammation, they're going to be able to recover from that. Right. But in middle age, maybe they don't show that, but underlying yeah. systemically, it's already happening. So maybe that slow process. So, so those are one ways that we could evaluate whether or not periodontal disease or oral inflammation is a trigger for other potentially systemic kind of inflammation. Yeah. And, and now, cause you mentioned the immune system, that's kind of the reverse direction where age related changes in the immune system mm -hmm. could be affecting oral health yes, and almost absolutely. certainly are. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 I mean, even, even if you look at immunocompromised patients, yeah, gingivitis, periodontal disease, like right. they'll have high levels of inflammation around their gut. Right. Which is interesting. So we're going to talk about rapamycin yeah, yeah. in a bit. So this relationship between immuno modulation yep. and periodontal disease, right. we'll, we'll come back to that, but super right, yeah. interesting. All right. So I think this is a good place to maybe take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about science. So we're going to end episode one here. So thank you for, you. Uh, for joining us. Um, and I hope that uh, you will join us for episode two, where we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the science behind uh, the biology of aging and its effects on oral health. And we'll talk a lot about rapamycin one more time. <laughs> I promise we will yep. talk about uh, rapamycin. So as always, uh, I invite you to uh, leave comments or ask questions below. And I hope that you will tune back in for episode two with John. Uh, that'll probably be up in about a week.